Now, welcome everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you, welcome you to this timely and important webinar on re realizing women's land rights in Africa and beyond, which is co-hosted by ADECRU in Mozambique, Action Aid, Both Ends, Enda Pronat in Senegal, Forum Mujer, Mujer in Mozambique, Roots Kenya, the Netherlands Land Academy, Landak, the Land Portal Foundation, and Oxfam. And it's my great honor to moderate this discussion. For those who don't know me, I'm Griet Steel, Assistant Professor at Utrecht University. And as a research coordinator of LAMDAC, I've led a year-long action research program on women's land rights in Africa, together with Michel Leuen, currently working at ILC. Now, with this webinar, we want to reflect on some of the key lessons and messages of the program and look how we can strengthen women's land rights in Africa, but also in other continents and countries across the globe. And for this reason, we have invited a very uh, diverse panel um, of four panelists from different uh, civil society organizations and grassroots movements. On the basis of their day-to-day -day work in the field, they will reflect on how they fight for women's improved access to, to and control over land and other natural resources to scale up women's land rights. So please allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Nzira Zau Deus. Nzira is the executive director from Forum Mujer in Mozambique, a civil society organization that for years has been working on gender equality and rural rights in communities in Mozambique. For the Women's Land Rights Program, they have teamed up with ADECRU, another co-organizer of this webinar. As a human rights activist, a member of the feminist movement, Nazira has advocated for the human rights of women and girls regarding, regarding violence, economic empowerment, political participation, and sexual and reproductive health. So welcome, Nazira. Second, we have a man on board. His name is El Haji Fai, program coordinator of Enda Pronat, Senegal, a civil society organization looking, looking or agroecological alternatives that reduce the use of pesticides and strengthen the position of rural families. As the project manager of Enda Pronat, El Haji has worked around questions on tenure security, agricultural politics, and agroecology in general. His day-to-day -day work is in French and Wolof, so this is why we would also like to welcome his colleague Marina, who will help out with translation, just in case it's needed, because his English is pretty well. Now, third, I also so welcome El Haji and Marina. Third, I also would like to welcome Frida Hituku, the executive director of Roots Kenya. Roots Kenya is a network of women-led community organizations in Kenya. It formed as a response to inadequate visibility of grassroots women in development and decision-making forums. Frida works with grassroots women and girls in 17 counties in Kenya and started programs that have seen many women because, um, become successful, lead farmers, landowners and leaders at the grassroots, including members of land boards. So welcome Frida. And last but not least, I would also, we would like to broaden a little bit our geographical focus. We would also like to welcome Sritama Gupta Baya from um, Oxfam, India. She has 16 years of experience on issues of governance of natural resources, rights, and livelihood, prim primarily with tribal communities in India. She has worked with national and international NGOs, with government of India on policy and advocacy related to tribal rights and livelihood. So she will speak on women's rights in the context of natural resources by advocating for importance of collective rights on how these enable a space for women to negotiate. So welcome to all of you. So what we will do in the next hour is to ask these four panelists a couple of questions about the bottlenecks of women land rights, also why it remains an important issue to focus on, as well as questions on their experiences and good practices of their day-to-day -day work in the field. Uh, and the opportunities to upscale these uh, good practices. After this first hour, we will be very happy to open the discussion and give room to the participants to ask questions. 
for which you can use this question feature um, so that we can do an effort to answer all the questions um, in the discussion after the conversations we have. Now, let me start to begin with a conversation with a question for El Haji Fai from uh, Enda Plomat in Senegal. So El Haji, maybe you could please share your thoughts with us on why women's land rights is an issue with so much attention focus, focused on. Thank you, Gretsch. Thank you. And good morning to everybody. Uh, before starting, I want just to insist on something. In fact, uh, the expression women's land rights is an expression that covers many realities. What kind of rights are we talking about? Access rights, concourse rights, ownership rights. It is important to define precisely the problem we are facing because uh, then the approach to find a solution will differ. Now, women's land rights mean a central issue also because it is becoming uh, land. It is is becoming scarce. This is due to several factors: democratic growth, land grabbing, as well as unsustainable agriculture practice that degrade resources, reducing available farm land, and increase competition over land resources. Now, then, women's land rights also remain a central issue because in communities we lack consensus on the issue. Still today, some people believe it is a false problem and even worse that those are westernized ideas that want to dispute our way of life and make a mess. So we need to make people realize this has a real problem. What is more the problem is often taken in isolation. The problem is uh, often taken in isolation without linking it to the global issue to the global issue relating to the perceptions of women in society. According to perception, women are considered by an immature, uh, an immature. They are uh, the women are incapable to take control of their own destiny, and therefore should always, always be under the responsibility of the man. In this man can be the father, the husband, or sometimes the the son. And all this relation between resources depend on this fact, on this relation. Also. It is not only about lands. We don't talk only about lands. We also need to work on women's access to the means of productions. Without those riches, for example, uh, the inputs, land cannot sell as a vector of economical appointment for, econ uh, for the women. So uh, finally, we found that uh, the approach to solve the issue there are uh, also a tendency to emphasize the legal dimension based on the belief that if things change on paper, things are solved, the problem are solved at the local level. In reality, the reference point for communities is not always the legal norm, but rather customers and practice. Therefore, we need to change uh, social norms and local practice. So uh, is what I want to do for the question. Now, thank you, Al Haji, for this very wide take on the on the issue of uh, women's land rights and to look it from a broad perspective. I would like to address the same question to Nzira as well. So, why do you think um, um, women's land rights remains an important issue to address with so much focus on it? Thank you, Brit, and thank you all for joining and uh, this uh, session. For us, uh, the main, the principal point that we can raise is that starting by saying that 80% of foods are produced by women, but 50% of land is owned by women. In Mozambique, these are the stati statistics. And legally, women do have equal access to land as men, is on the law. So 
Unfortunately, we have a, a big challenge with the asymmetric power relation between men and women, uh, founded on social and cultural dynamics in the society characterized by patriarchal practice. That is uh, an obstacle for women to have access to land. And so in, it's used to be ruled by customer law um, as a governance of, of land and law. And often uh, women stay in the secondary place in terms of uh, have access to land. So it's not understood uh, that women deserve to uh, manage to control the land controlled assets in Mozambique, especially we, we, we see this also. So very few women have this control power on the land. And we think that uh, these uh, cultural and social norms is being assumed also by the government that should do something to challenge this and revert this, this situation. The other thing that is less important is that we see that we are receiving a lot of investors coming to Africa looking for land to produce uh, food, agribusiness, and uh, forest, and so on, and is impacted negatively on women. So uh, women is now suffering a lot of displacement, is lost, losing their own lands uh, because of the rest of we are seeing a lot of conflicts on women uh, uh, on, uh, on controlling on controlling the land and on this process also we we, we have the fact of that we the the decision makers are, are getting in the uh, corruption system where politicians are in both sides uh, trying to get capital trying to be allies of the investors rather than consider the communities, consider the, the small farmers that are mainly women, and this is impacting negatively on the life of women. A lack of commitment of the government on implementation of the legislation, on challenge the social and cultural barriers, and not assuming this uh, important, um, uh, important thing that is a w uh, majority of the population that is a women that are women need land for producing uh, is use land for their own life so land is a life for women in most things not just for food but is even in all africa uh, and besides producing food the land is identity for women uh, we 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 come with a, we have a big a strong connection with land uh, looking for the social, di our dynamics and cultural uh, community practices where we, we, we found the, the traditional uh, treatment coming from the plants, coming from, from, from the trees. So we use this uh, practice to, to, to treat our, our life, to treat our, our children. So it's not just producing food and also we have connections with our ancestors. We, we, we have some practices, rural women and farmers, that we connect with a, a land coming with, uh, with our strength. We, we go there, we get inspiration. And so they have this invisibility, invisibility of the, the, the needs that land means to women. So land is not just a space for women. It's not a piece of, uh, of, of, of sand, sand for women. It's more than that. It's, it's about the life of women in community. Now, thank you very much, Nzira, for stressing so explicitly how central land is in not just the livelihood of women, but also in the in the identity of women. And, and also together with El Haji, I think you very clearly stressed a couple of problems why land, women's land rights is so important and why it should be at the center of the agenda. So let's move from Senegal to Mozambique to Kenya now and ask Frida also like why why is it so necessary to put to put attention to women's land rights Thank you Ruth this is an important issue one because uh, women land rights is a human rights issue and we are not doing women justice by denying them their human rights uh, here at the country level I can confidently say that we haven't given women land rights enough attention. It is not a mainstream reform agenda. 
in the land sector and even in the women movement in itself, we find that uh, most of us acknowledge this inequality in our private corridors, but in the public corridors where resources are allocated, where budgets are developed, where flagship projects are designed, and where government plans are developed, it is it is not featured as a major reform agenda. And uh, even within the land institution themselves, you find that women land rights has not been acknowledged as a problem. And that is to mean that then within the public system that is allocating resources and is responsible for delivering on people's rights and giving them services, we don't have real uh, champion inside the public service to push for that agenda. Kenya have been undertaking land reforms for the longest, for over a decade now. But these reforms are really, uh, broadly, they're gender blind. And so they have taken precedence of our real and land rights issue. On the demand side, which is where, as an organization, we sit as groups Kenya, as advocates, we see that there are also very few actors that are demanding for this, pushing for this right as a core area of focus. And this, we, I think this is not a Kenyan problem. It's actually broadly, even at the international level, you will see that women land rights is always addressed as a side issue, as a side event, which is uh, disheartening, considering the level of inequalities that we are talking about. In Kenya, we don't even have the data itself. We cannot authoritatively say that uh, this is the amount of land that is under the hand in the hands of women. Of course, there are statistics that have been thrown here or there, uh, around 1% or less than 2%, which is again uh, not very not good statistics at all. But even the uh, lack of data in itself is a demonstration that we have not given this issue the attention that it deserves. The fact that we just the fact that we don't have data. The resources for advocacy are also limited. And most of the time uh, we are engaging in what you would term, uh, it's not sustained advocacy. It's not sustained advocacy. Women land rights like Nzira and El Haji have said is, is not just a legal problem. It's also a social issue. So just enacting legal reform like Kenya has done in its in itself will not transform the lives of women and girls. It is sad that actually we've turned a blind eye to the social and cultural discrimination issues that are aided by patriarchy. And I personally believe it is the greatest contribution of why we have a policy practice gap. So it, it needs to be, we need to, to put more focus on this issue and look at the social angle of the problem. It is fashionable to reform policies and law. It puts any country and government and policymaker in a good international map. But if such reforms are not accompanied by, you know, social cultural reforms, then we don't see real transformation in the life of in the life of girls. And I think that's where most African countries are. The legal reforms themselves, they are not an end by themselves. We need to do more, and that's why I think we need to put more emphasis into this uh, advocacy aid agenda. Okay, thank you, Frida. It's a very clear plea to put it like more central, even at, at uh, agendas, uh, at the policy making agendas. I would like to move to Sri Tama to give her an, yeah, an Indian perspective on why you think like women's land rights are remain an important issue to be addressed, and also to see like. Yeah, as we see now from the African countries, that it's not just to be considered as a legal problem, but also very much as a social issue. So, Sri Tama, could you give your take on these questions? Uh, thank you, Greed. Uh, it's been a, a great opportunity for me to be part of this uh, discussion and le learn from the African experiences and share mine from the Indian context. 
uh, I think there are a lot of similarities between what the conditions as pointed out uh, in Africa and India and, and the problems are quite similar. And uh, to start with, I, I would say, you know, the basic concept that, you know, um, women frequently have what we call de facto or land use rights as compared to men's uh, ownership or DJ rights. So, so often we see that women often have use rights that are mediated in terms of their relationship with men, whether it's uh, property or land, sometimes the ancestral property or land that's held is, is of the women is defined by the relationship with men and not as women independently. That has been a traditional reason why women have been kept out of decision making. And if we even just see the agricultural sector, which is the biggest employer in India, 74% uh, of the farmers are actually, the farm work are being done by women, whereas 14% uh, have rights to land. I think it's very similar to uh, situations in the, what was pointed out in Mozambique and in, 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 in any other part, a large part of uh, Africa. So even despite their dominance in agricultural labor force, uh, women continue to face extreme disadvantages in terms of pay, land rights, and the most important is, is representation in agricultural decision making continue to be poor. There is a very big agri agrarian crisis, uh, and again, uh, these groups, uh, the women, remain invisible in the whole process because, again, because they are not the owners of land. And uh, with fragmentation of land and increasing in population, uh, under, it's given that land is a very finite resource. So in the longer run, uh, the tiny pieces of land, even if they have tenurial rights, will, will not be enough to fulfill any livelihood requirements uh, of the people. And this brings me to um, another major issue, which I'm going to focus my uh, talk on, is what, what we have also ignored, uh, or rather we see, should say the women land rights movements needs to build into their uh, agenda the, 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 the common resources, uh, which are mostly the indigenous communities and women especially depend on. Even if we just look at worldwide figure of 2.5 billion people, rely on indigenous and community land, yet uh, much of the energy on women's land, forest and water rights have uh, really not focused on the collective rights, but on individual land titles, which is very important. But there is this whole resource space uh, where women actually depend on. And how men and women use these resources reflects gendered access. And if you see the world over, the depletion of this common property resource poses a severe threat to the livelihoods and food security of poor women uh, and men. And also climatically, they are the most vulnerable people. So women, again, remain a majorly uh, disadvantaged uh, in, in when the natural resources uh, deplete. And, um, and, and these communities, at least in India, we just see, uh, it, it just as an example, if I tell you, in the state of Odisha, a particular state where uh, deforestation or forest loss has doubled in five years, the, the traveling time for women and girls to, to get a headload of firewood has increased from four kilometers to seven kilometers. So that increases the drudgery and the impact on different groups are felt differently when there is loss of these resources. So this, this, this raises the question that how can we safeguard women's land, water and forest rights across all 10 year system? I think that should also be part of the agenda. Now, thank you very well, Sritama, and I really like the way you also like enlarge the whole subject of not saying like we are talking just about land, but we are talking about natural resources in general, and that also very much relates to um, the way El Haji already started, that we don't have to see it as a problem in as isolation from other issues. Now, I think the four of you have very, very well managed to set the scene and to see like, okay, what are the problems we are talking about and what are the kind of issues we are addressing? Was also uh, with the next question, the round of questions, I would like to see what you are doing in order to address th these, uh, these issues. And eh? because you're all very active in the field of women's land rights, so I would like to learn a little bit uh, from the four of you, what kind of good practices you have already in place. So let me first uh, um, 
ask this question to El Haji. So could you talk uh, briefly about the, the successes that you have already achieved uh, with some good practices or the interventions you do, do on a day-to-day -day basis with Enda Pronat? El Haji, are you there? Excuse me. <laughs> no okay. Uh, thank you, Great. Uh, as I said uh, previously, we mostly need to influence local practice, practice, uh, but also change public policy toward a better prioritization of gender issues. To do so, we need to take action on the two levels, at the national levels and at the local levels. We need to raise people awareness to influence practice and perception at the local, at the local, uh, uh, the, the perception of the local actors. And mostly important, we need to involve those who hold the power at the local levels in the process. For example, the customer chef, the religious authority, the mayors, the local representative, etc. We need also to influence public opinions on the issue relating to women's rights in general, in general, and especially in land's rights through radio, TV show, etc. To advocate, we need also to advocate with women's movement for the state uh, to institutionalize good practice. Also, uh, we need to, do, to also reinforce intellectual and political capacity of women so they uh, uh, so that they, they 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 may have power in local decision maker institution what and do about this we do a local workshop uh, to raise awareness on local actors because i think that only knowledge can make change so we have to awareness all the actors at the local level. We organize workshop, typically gather more than 1,000 people with a local representative, local administration, chiefs, all the leaders of, uh, at the local level. Therefore, it is actually those leading figure of public opinion that we sensitize to the issue. Then, they must take what they learn to the grassroots level and discuss uh, and continue discussion. But it is not enough, I think. We also organize training for a specific group of local actors we call land facilitator. It is usually around six people per country. These facilitators organize workshop at the village at the local uh, at the local level to reach any more uh, any more persons we the local the local the workshop at the village level are based uh, what we call uh, a village approach it means that we regrouped all villages at the public square to discuss the issue and debate on women's action to life Facilitators start by sensitizing villages to the stake of women's access, access to land with the support of the chief, of the, of the, of the, of the religious leaders, etc. We also organize workshops that specially target women. Those workshops allows, women to work, uh, allows us to work with women's group to the local levels to reinforce their advocacy and leadership so they may better argue and negotiate their land rights with women, with, with, uh, with, with the men. <laughs> we also, uh, and, and on, on these activities, the collecting data is more important, has uh, said uh, Frida uh, previously. We have to collect data and to prove the, 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 the problem. We also organize radio show on women's access land at the local level in local language to expand the reach of all those sensitizations. But at the national levels, 
we seek to reinforce social movement advocating for women's land rights through the national network of rural women in Senegal, which you group all association on, 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 of rural women from all regions in Senegal. We also do this work through the National Alliance for Women's Access to Land, with Shiro Group NGOs, Women's Association, Research, uh, Research Institute, and the targets their advocacy efforts towards the, the, the state. We also organize advocacy meeting with the Minister of Women and the Minister of Agriculture and also the state of uh, institutions, the, the institution state that work for a better inclusion of women needs in public policy policy. We also organize technical workshop with the social society, uh, social society, this is the, the civil society organization and the women's movement to gather strategy and policy brief, policy proposal for the reform, for the land reform. Finally, we organize also radio and TV show to better sensitize the uh, public opinion and decision makers on women's land rights. It is uh, one of the most uh, famous action we do at the local level and national level. Thank you. No, thank you, El Haji. That's a wide variety of uh, activities, and I'm sure maybe later in the discussion there will be concrete questions on how you do it uh, concretely or practically. But we will also like to move on to the to the next speaker. So Nzira, could you also give like an overview of what kind of good practices are you, and what kind of successes you have already achieved in um, uh, towards women's land rights? Okay, the first success that we can share is that when we designed the land in 1997, we, women's movement, we engaged deeply on this process. So we had, uh, as a result, this uh, law, progressive law, progressive law that we have now that ensure rights for women, men, and communities. Uh, but the implementation is still a challenge. In Mozambique. So what we are doing is to disseminate this land, this law, uh, to all levels, especially at community level, and use different language systems. We we have different local languages speaking more than ten. So so to the land law and also raising an awareness uh, on women of their rights that they have rights and they need to. To demand this right. So engage with awareness, political training on women, and so women uh, can demand their rights. And we managed to have some we uh, engage actively at local level, demanding the respect of the land and also challenge some cultural barriers. The other thing that we're doing is uh, build collective action and build social movements. So women can uh, come together and help each other, uh, understanding the, the challenge and understanding that the problem is not just with one woman, but is, is happening to one. And this process building also solidarity among uh, communities or women that are, have been losing their lands for parents or for, for relatives or even from the state. So this movement, the solidarity movement, is something that is is growing out and needs to be and it seems to be uh, giving some results because women are resisting. Women are resisting and they are talking that this is my land, this is the land for my ancestors, this is an earth my future for my my future. I'll say that okay for my for my son, my daughters and. And it's my, it's our land, and this movement is growing up and spreading till the sub-regional uh, uh, region, Southern Africa region, and also we managed to have this uh, big campaign, Kilimanjaro campaign, that was uh, from all over uh, Africa, climbed the, the the Kilimanjaro mountain, the highest mountain in Africa, demanding that the the the, the government, the, the the head of state. 
affects the, um, the, 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 um, the law also to, to in, uh, the laws where women uh, can assess and control their land, also demand more investment for women to work and land. That was a big uh, campaign running uh, in 2016. And it was a big, we had women, more than 50 women, that managed to meet a president directly and give them, uh, give them, the president give him the letter where women were demanding uh, specifically uh, uh, points uh, that need to be improved in our our legal frame and also in practical way uh, in Mozambique. The other thing that also we we are doing it's organized community workshop as LHG also mentioned and uh, my previous colleagues also mentioned and small groups debates and where we can discuss deeply and understand deeply about the, the, the laws um, and discuss the prioritizing, the priorities on the community and women and how to address any other issues around, not just at all, but also violence against women that is not at community level. And many of uh, we are documenting uh, the stories of women, doing uh, documenting uh, right, written documents and video where women can bring their voice, to tell their stories. So powerful tool that we 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 use. So we you can see that I'm afraid I have to cut it here because the connection is not fully. Um... Fully very confident. They feel that they, they are too powerful. Zira, I'm afraid I have to, to cut it here because the connection is not fully, fully have to look at it, but I very much liked the, the, the ideas you brought in and the, the whole idea of, of uh, building solidarity, of movement building, and, and, and the way, as El Hadi already mentioned as well, as we can work at different levels, but also at the continent-wide level, this movement to Kilimanjaro was very important. And Groot Skene, I was also very active in, in, in this uh, Kilimanjaro event. So maybe we can move on to uh, Frida and ask also uh, from the perspective of Groot Kenya some uh, good practices and what were like the main, um, yeah, Thank main, you, uh, main issues that um, helped you to achieve success in moving the women's land rights agenda forward. Thank you, Ruth. I agree with the, my colleagues. At Groot Kenya, we are using a very right-based uh, right based approach, I would say, of bringing together the people who are uh, mostly impacted by this violation, and those are the grassroots women in their community and girls living in the rural areas, and organizing them in what Nzira described as a strong social movement for collective action. Of course, we don't stop at organizing we go on to inject uh, capacity, whether it is on how to advocate, equip them with the right political skill, and also equip them with evidence for their advocacy, which is the issue of data that I talked about. And because there's a data vacuum in the country, we uh, have adopted a very innovative way of generating land data, which is community-generated data, where the women generate data on land ownership, control, and access within their own uh, jurisdiction, where they are and equipped with, when they are organized, then they have the right skills, uh, advocacy and political skills. They understand what the law says as far as the uh, access to right, the right to land for women and men. And of course, equipped with data, then we accompany them to actually influence the action of policymakers or people who are in a decision-making position to influence uh, policies, to influence plans and to influence government budget. The good thing uh, in Kenya is that there is a space for public participation. And for us, we have taken that space very seriously. And we consistently make sure that we are supporting the women in their organized form to be present in those spaces where resources are located and voice their priority. And women land rights is one of their priority and monitor that actually they are taken up and ho uh, hold government accountable on this. So that's one of the um, that one of the 
best practice that I would say is building an accompanying social movement, and particularly the movement at the grassroots level. But we also know that we have to connect with the other uh, advocates and activists at the, nation, uh, the national level. And that's why, for us, being part of the Women to Kilimanjaro was very important and still very important, a very active uh, multi-stakeholder movement here in the country. We have managed to develop an implementation charter, charter together with the Ministry of Land and uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring tools where we can monitor the actions of the government as far as, um, as, far as the, uh, realizing the women land rights, as far as that is concerned. And so movement building for sure is a big area of interest for Groups Kenya and a big area of the, um, investment. The grassroots champion, again, they do a lot of work. We live in an environment where the justice system is not very friendly for the category of people that I'm talking about. So most of them rely on alternative justice mechanism. And so we have developed the grassroots women to be champions. Some of them will call themselves uh, community watchdog groups. Others will say they are paralegals, but the most important thing is that equi they are equipped with legal understanding and they are able to mediate uh, family disputes where women are impacted, where girls and children are impacted. And we have seen numerous and isolated cases of success for people living in very poor and marginalized areas that would never ever afford to go to court to seek redress. So these uh, women have done the go in between. Of course, it's a lot of uh, unpaid care work, but it comes with its benefit in the sense that those who have not, who are not able to access the formal justice, then they have people that they can, um, they can go to, which is uh, something that youth has invested for some time. The other thing is uh, testing, developing, and piloting different kind of social models for documenting land rights for all. And uh, we, we do this because the, the model, the system of documenting people's rights in the country, I would say is very skewed towards uh, conferring absolute ownership of land to the men, uh, mm. which is unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. And for us, we are constantly testing and trying other models that would be an alternative to what we have today in the formal system that actually document the rights of everybody who has an interest in the land. And that's why we came up with the community-led land mapping model. And we are talking about documenting the rights of women, whether they are mothers, their wives, their sisters, their children, and men as well. So these are things that we have implemented at a starting scale. We have replicated in areas where government have cooperated with us, especially the county government. And we actually do hope that in the long run, because there's also a lot of advocacy that we are doing on this area, that the government will be able to evaluate this kind of models, test them, because they have the power to achieve scale more than we can. And so adopt and actually formalize them. Okay, thank you very much, Frida. Very interesting also to bring in, apart from this movement building, which we see indeed is very important, but also this whole idea of monitoring and documenting to bring it in. So thank you very much. I would like to hear from uh, Tritama as well. What, what do you see as a good practices in achieving success towards women's land rights in India? And what made these initiatives and strategies successful? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as Oxfam India, we have been involved uh, with women land rights on many levels, uh, on recognition of women as farmers, and uh, on the on the common resources. Actually, uh, we when we started our work uh, on the on the issue of natural resources and rights over natural resources and tenurial security. Uh, we we honestly we didn't start with women's group in mind. It was it was largely how communities and villages and village councils would uh, play a critical loan in that. But however, as we moved ahead, uh, of course, women emerged as a natural and very key stakeholder in the process because um, it was. Uh, 
uh, of course we had training and we have we have a we have a law in india which emerged after a lot of grassroots movement it's called the forest rights act by which uh, communities living on forest lands their rights for cultivation as well as community rights for management and governance is recognized so this is the first law which gives title in the name of both the husband and the wife for lands that they're cultivating so there was space for women and for overall governance where women's participation in the village council uh, had to be uh, 50%. Uh, so that gave us, uh, you know, a legal teeth uh, to work with. And we saw wherever uh, they, this law, uh, we were able to work with the communities in claiming their rights. Women came forward to defend their forests. Uh, once they had their tenurial security and rights, we, we saw women came forward to defend their forests when it was being logged or timber being sold. And women resisted against the harassments by the forest departments. So the, the very interesting thing that is once they have their rights, they asserted their rights. And, and, and I think that's a very critical part because uh, often just uh, recognition of rights or tenure security is realized only when people assert their rights. I, I would still say we have a long way to go to give them space in decision making in governance and management of their resources. We still have to go a long way. But um, uh, we we uh, we have been uh, uh, working with village councils where uh, at least uh, you know women find a voice within the village councils because they are often marginalized in their own own communities. So that's another big area uh, which is clearly linked with again governance of the resources. And uh, what we uh, also see is that um, uh, collective decision making in collective spaces are empowering women much more as uh, an individual woman is deriving strength from the collective and in the longer run it penetrates in the family level decision making too where you know a very um, uh, charismatic and very uh, um, uh, good leadership wherever they have emerged and uh, so um, so that's that's uh, that's been a very important uh, le learning and we also see women at the forefront of grassroots struggles uh, wherever land uh, is being uh, diverted or land acquisition is being uh, is happening so that um, that's been our experience of uh, of working with women and uh, we are also trying to now link it to the gender justice campaign uh, to, to, to and get the gender groups who are actually working on women issues to start talking on land land for women and common resources and at the same time groups who are working on uh, on natural resources bringing the women's land right agenda into their issues no, thank you very much. Very interesting, Sri Dhamma. Very interesting in general that we see all these kind of approaches, all these kind of good practices ranging from awareness raising workshops to movement building, um, including women in decision making, documenting women's land rights, also capacity building. And what I was wondering, or what we were also wondering during the program, and we have still like a quarter of an hour to address this question, is like, what what do we need to scale up these approaches? Eh? Because as, as Hattie already said, we are working on different levels, but many of you start very much from the grassroots. So the question is like, what do these grassroots roots, um, initiatives, what do they need in order to scale up? And what would be then the core message uh, to policy makers? So maybe uh, El Haji, you could give your thought on it. Like, what what are what are the what do we need to scale up these approaches, and what would you be your message to policymakers? Thank you, Greg. I will be very short on these questions. I think that uh, civil society, NGOs, or the women organization at the local level, at the national level, are doing many good things. Are adopting many good practice but they have not uh, means to scale up this so to scale up this i think that the only actors which can do this is the government uh, through the, politi the, the the public policy so to scale up the good practice we are doing on the field we need to capital capitalize. I think that it is a good word. We capitalize all this good practice and 
whole approach of project programs, of civil society programs, and also of some state programs, but only in the even in the in the in the, in the government have some few good programs, but they are very short and they don't do, uh, integrate in the local uh, the national international international politics. So we have to capitalize all this practice and also uh, to make scaling up those initiative encrypted integrating them in the government's policy and program. I think that it is what we do first and if you do this, I think that uh, it will have to, to uh, it will be good to to, to scale up uh, our initiative and our, our practice. Okay, great. Thank you, Alhaji. That's very clear. Eh? Like a, a, a big call for integration. I would like to address the same question to Inzira. Like, what do you think uh, we need to scale up uh, these interventions you've been talking about, uh, these good practices, and what would be like the key messages for policymakers in that sense? Um, I think that we need to continue investing on the building and strengthening grassroots movement. Uh, and women's initiative to monitor the implementation of the law and also sitting with the, with the dialogue space, um, continue to produce evidence on what is going on on this uh, mapping data collection that can we, we can show um, on the table on negotiation um, that this work, what this is happening in the field, and uh, so government can understand that. Uh, I think that also it's important to have um, the champions in the, involve more the local leaders and um, communities uh, that uh, they have a lot, a lot of power, so they engage on this. So we need to map who are the people that are with the with the women on this, this campaign and this struggle. Okay, Zira, that's great. Uh, I think also your connection was much better. So uh, thank you for solving that issue. You know, overall, I think we're doing great to be connected all over the globe in such a way. Thanks for that. Um, very good uh, to mention indeed the need, the need of data to show and to really put something on the table into when you are negotiating. And that's also an interesting one to, to move um, on to Frida, because you were talking a lot about data collection, really, um, yeah, to really monitor and document. So I would like to ask the same question to you also, like, like what do you think we need to scale up these approaches as you were talking about uh, community lab mapping and other kind of activities and good practices? And what will be, in that sense, also your key message to policymakers? Thank you, Vrit. I think we all agree that to disrupt the status quo, we need to build a strong social movement. I would say a strong grassroots women-led social movement. So I agree with the other panelists that we should uh, dedicate resources, time, and effort to strengthen that kind of movement that kind of movement on women land rights but also we need to identify our champions inside the public service and i had alluded to that in my um, in the last section it is good to have champions who are outside the formal service you know the grassroots champions that i spoke about but even inside the system we need people who will be pushing this agenda that we are so passionate about and placing it as a top um, pick in the menu in the government agenda we also need to inject some feminist uh, leadership inside the land institution, I would say, to disrupt the patriarchy that is derailing our agenda. And that is why, as groups, every day we are trying very much to build the leadership capacity of grassroots women so that they can um, apply and be appointed in the land control board, in water committees, in uh, water boards, in the agricultural board. Because unless we have people who have a serious feminist principles and values sitting in those positions, then our agenda will keep on being derailed. And it should be the agenda of all of us, including government. 
Um, the other thing I think in terms of uh, achieving scale, I uh, agree with El Haji. Uh, government sits in a very privileged position unless they actually evaluate these models that we are talking about that guarantees people's rights regardless of the kind of tenor regime they find themselves in, unless the government evaluates, tests them, and adopts them through resourcing and implementing them, because they have the mandate to deliver on women land rights then uh, we may not achieve skill. I would say the power of achieving skill rests largely with the government. Uh, what is my message to policymakers? Bring the women land rights to the mainstream land reform agenda. We want to see it featured in the vision 2030 of Kenya. We want to see plans, we want to see budgets, and we want to see flagship projects that are geared towards removing the obstacles that currently hinder women from accessing land rights, even when the law states otherwise. I would call them to rethink the land documentation um, system that we currently have that confers all ownership, I mean absolute ownership men, and disregards women as mothers, as wives, as siblings, and as daughters. I, I also take cognizant that majority of women are in the small scale land holding with user rights, of course. So it is important to recognize this and uh, give protection and support to this category of people and minimize the threats that they are currently facing. And Zira talked about this from large scale investments, whether they are driven by government, local or foreign investors. I will insist again that we need to have new, uh, we need to inject progressive staff into the land institution. We need to see feminist leadership within the land institution, because currently as it is, it's overcrowded with patriarchy all the way to the devolved level, and it doesn't help in solving the social cultural issues that all the panelists spoke about in the problem analysis, so that we can also end that anti-gender equality attitude that is significantly contributing to the policy and practice gap. And uh, I hope you do agree with me that human resources form an important part of the means of implementation. And if we don't address that core part, then we cannot deliver. The internal change needs to happen in terms of the composition of the people who are driving the agenda within the institution. So international governments, I would say that they have the power that is drawn from the development assistance that they give to governments in the South. And I think uh, Sweden and others, I think Canada have set a good example of adopting feminist foreign policies, which uh, in a way, uh, puts an obligation on part of the recipient, but also in incentivizes those governments to do things um, that deliver on women priorities. And I would say this is a good approach. Let's persuade through the power that we each and each actor hold, let's persuade government to deliver on women land rights as an issue of, of, of priority. Uh, of course, uh, dedicate predictable and adequate resources to advocates, to women rights organizations, to grassroots group, to strengthen the movement and to for sustained advocacy. Ad hoc advocacy is not going to deliver. The land, land rights issues are sensitive. The land sector is, um, is complex. We need sustained and strong advocacy, strong social movement that are adequately resourced and that they can predict their future. The other thing say is to the UN. And this is, let's finalize the methodologies for the indicators, 1.4.2, the SDG indicator, 5.8.2, so that government can start uh, reporting on this and so that we start generating data on land um, by gender and by age. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frida, for this very powerful message. Uh, before we mo we we um, move to the questions, because they are entering already a lot of questions, but I would also first like to ask Fridama to if she could uh, give or add from an Indian perspective, like what what is needed to scale up these interventions you've been talking about before, and what would be like your core messages to policymakers. Yeah, uh, mm, I, I think uh, a lot of it has been covered by the other panelists, which are quite. Uh, 
uh, it is the, the the main agency is the government which has the responsibility of sca scaling up through programs and budgetary allocations but as civil society and uh, implementing organizations and movements uh, what we definitely um, there are number of demonstrable models which we have created but they uh, they remain largely isolated or uh, you know small islands of uh, successful models primarily because um, there needs to be needs to be a lot of evidence based uh, advocacy for its adoption we need to create those evidences we need to advocate based on evidences uh, for its adoption and um, as previously i mentioned that uh, scaling up which 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 is in the hands of the civil society and the movements group is to politicize the agenda and broaden the agenda of land rights and incorporate the common resources as well um, coming to the messages to the uh, policy makers um, i think it was previously also been said that um, we need data in any 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 interventions to make we need to we need to have a disaggregated gender disaggregated data even to decide what it is actually looks like so so we need we need to we need to uh, make part of uh, the agriculture census which we have in india uh, to involve to count the landless uh, women farmers um, then disaggregate data in terms of both uh, land which has been regularized by the government and the land which is held privately access to financial uh, support to be made available to small and marginal women farmers for land development activities to make those land much more productive because often the land that is given under government regularized programs to women are of course not in the best uh, land quality so the productivity is low so that uh, needs to be uh, taken care of and uh, women should have the rights and decision making on the kind of agriculture they want to do um, because a uh, large women come from the perspective of livelihood and uh, food security so biodiversity in terms of crops and supporting different things like you know, grain banks and uh, primary processing etc again technology women friendly technology is something which uh, um, which needs to come to the uh, to the forefront because as we as we see most of the farm work are being done by women and technology again is not very uh, women friendly uh, because they they design with men in mind um, and again i think the uh, it has already been said we want uh, women uh, represented in the decision making uh, positions um, so that these issues become part of the primary uh, policy processes and uh, even the agriculture extension and service department should have um, uh, women personnel uh, with that and uh, with regards to commons this was the land as agriculture um, we we need a comprehensive policy for decentralized forest governance and in indian context with women playing a central role in the village council must be integrated into the policy and practice and uh, we what we see is a large part of land being diverted and poor are facing evictions and displacement so uh, again uh, you know land being taken up for commercial plantations and um, land banks are being created again this again affects the women and it is it is our our uh, experience that while men opt for comp monetary compensations women's approach is much more from a livelihood perspective therefore uh, i think the consent of women should be mandatory in case of displacement of eviction in case of consent at least 50 percent uh if it's at the consent is taken at the village level 50 percent should be women uh and uh, and and finally uh, women should be part of any committees that mediates conflict related to land and natural resources now thank you very much Sweetama. thank uh Thanks to the four panelists to really uh, bring to the fore like what can be done uh, to, to put and actually that's indeed what we put at the center from the beginning of this webinar that it's still a continuous fight to put women's land rights at the center of the international development agenda and I think the four of you have really nicely managed to, to first yeah, set a scene and to really say like what, what are the bottlenecks, what are the problems uh, but also very much uh, looking forward to good practices, good solutions, and also concrete suggestions for scaling up. 
Of course, if you bring in so many differ, different perspectives and so many different uh, suggestions, it also uh, poses a lot of questions. So what came in is already more than 10 different questions. So we still have half an hour, a little bit less than half an hour for discussion. So I will go through it one by one and address them to you and then we can uh, yeah, just have an open discussion on, on the issues that have been um, addressed already. Now my first question is to El Haji. Um, it's not my question, it's a question of one of the participants and uh, this participant says that you have described really good capacity building work for women for tenure security and the participant was wondering if you have evidence that your workshops and capacity building efforts have increased access to justice for land rights. So, El Hadi, would you be able to answer the question uh, the, to really look at the outcomes or what you have reached with these uh, workshops and capacity building activities? Hello, great. Yeah. Can I go? Definitely. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I said that um, this workshop was uh, an opportunity for women uh, to negotiate uh, land on, 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 on the local levels with the uh, with administrator, with the... Uh, and the results of all this process, because it is a big, a big process uh, between sensitization at the common uh, and sensitization at the local and the, at the village, and also they had uh, some, what do you say, the parcel de terre qui leur été affecté. Segment, segment, segment. Well, well, yes. Segment of land. Voilà, de, de, de terre, quoi, de, de terrain qui leur été affecté. So they have, the result is many of these women had uh, land and they had paper to to prove yes. that it is their own lands, but it is available in the area where land is a property, uh, individual property. But in other uh, regions, land is not property of one person. In this country, in this in these regions, what women are revendicate is to implicate on decision maker on the common resource. It's more important, and I, I like the, 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 the group, the Sreta Gamma uh, Gupta position on this. There is land, she is, can, can be uh, divided between the, the, the persons, but there is many lands which is a common uh, research, and women don't have their, their, their own segment of land. So in this uh, option, we were able to, to work with the community uh, to integrate women in the policy, in the decision maker. It is more important. And have you also within this uh, communal land um, regions or, or areas, have you also uh, achieved some concrete results in that aspect? Oui, here it is more difficult to 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 to, to try to measure the impact because uh, we want just to sensitize the women and the 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 the, the men to mm -hmm. inform about any decision on on land resource, but uh, now we are on the process and we will uh, capitalize, capitalize uh, the results on this. But in individual parts, we have concrete results with women which have land and which have, but which have title on, on this land. Okay, now very interesting. Um, I'm afraid we have to move on to the next question, otherwise we will never be able to answer all of them. This is a question for Sri Dhamma. Um, about uh, the recent Supreme Court order to evict tribals whose claims for land ownership have been rejected. And the question is, is yeah. how this, uh, this relates to the land rights under the Forest Rights Act? 
Okay, uh, this, this is a huge issue. I will not get into much of it, but I would just update on this that uh, uh, th there has been a lot of momentum. I was, you know, last two days we were very busy with trying to, uh, you know, support, uh, get support from different quarters and the, the movements and the organizations finally were able to push the central government to act on it and we have got uh, suspension from this court saying eviction they have asked um, to suspend uh, the any eviction for now at least for four uh, four months and uh, the state governments have been asked to 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 provide for what uh, what is the process that has been undertaken for recognition of rights and what are the processes that are being followed in case of rejection so there has been some little breather or victory as a result of a lot of pressure from the civil society Okay, now thank you very much. Um, I also have a question for Frida. There is a participant who would like to have a little bit more explanation on um, on how the land mapping model or the, the, the community land maps, how it works. So, <clears throat> of course, the community land mapping model is a step-by-step -step process where you start identi uh, by identifying what are the gaps in terms of uh, land data and specifically gender data, because that is where group's interest is, and what are the kind of evidence that women would want to build for their advocacy. And uh, after you've had that kind of consultation uh, with the women, then you build their capacity to understand what is the legal and political context that they would be working in. You also, we also support them to have um, what you call stakeholder consultation. People um, like policy experts or people who have interest in land reforms across the country. And after that, then you develop with them a tool. And this is a research tool and uh, the tool can be developed by the grassroots women by on their own or through co-creation so for us we've tried both models where the women develop the tool by themselves and also where they partner with professional researchers to develop the tool and after that within a certain jurisdiction it could be a county or a certain area that is zoned off based on the kind of tenor regime it could be community land or an area that is uh, largely occupied by private land or even public land. And so within that area, they do the enumeration, they generate the data on ownership, on use, on uh, control, and even on legal status. And then after that data is generated, they analyze it, of course, um, develop trends or get some advocacy messages out of it, but with backed evidence of the data that they've collected and using this, that is what they, then they use to advocate. It's a model that we have tried severally in different areas, but we also, we've also partnered with the county government in a government called Moranga to actually use it to document the public lands in that uh, county. So it's a people-led process where they create inventories of land in their own uh, jurisdiction, in their own counties or locations, and also they are able to demonstrate who is controlling the land. Is it men, is it women, or is it uh, the state? Okay, thank you, Frida. I do have another question, actually, also for all the panelists to be addressed, but maybe we can um, first ask it to Inzira. It's like, why we talk about land rights required for women and why we don't, in Africa, but why we don't talk about joint land rights? So that's for men and women together. Um, in fact, in Mozambique, we have joint title land rights. And it's, um, it's, it's a good one and it's a good way to do that. But in the practice way, uh, since that where we, we mentioned about the challenge with the, the power relation and, and, and women do not have enough uh, capacity to negotiate this and it's more uh, under culture and understood that women must obey men is not being applied uh, properly 
so this is approach that we think that could be the better one to to use the land title also land community we have to depending on the contest depending on the area what is is a better way and a, a, a good um, it's a good uh, mechanism that not discriminate and not taking right for anyone. So it's not something that you not take it in consideration. In fact, it is. So in the workshops that we run it, we were able to share that we may also um, have this chance to be uh, on the title, online title, with a man, not just a man or women. And we use this also with a man when we find that the there is a resistance that women can resist, resist the land on their own name. So it's one it's one way also to to to, to use it. And we we think that work a lot in some areas, but in other areas that we have these problems of uh, power is not taken into consideration. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, thank you, Nzira. Very interesting. I do have another question. It's very interesting also on power, no? because uh, the participant says that it seems like there may be resistance to actualizing women's, land, women's rights when doing so threatens the power of, uh, or authority of people who perceive to be losing power when women gain individual and communal rights. So the question of this participant, and I just put it in the in the group so the one who would like to answer can just answer is like what sorts of barriers are erected by power brokers who don't want women to gain and how can this be addressed I can I can attempt to answer that question but I also want to comment on what Nzira said you know when we talk about women land rights and I like what uh, the famous author Chimamanda said we have to define our problem. Our problem is women land rights and we should not sugarcoat it. When we talk about women land rights, we are not just talking about women right to own land. We are talking about women rights to participate in land governance institution. We are talking about their capacity to use and develop that land, their access to financing so that they can invest in that land and the, their ability and opportunity to be able to say that within common lands, the resources that we get out of here, whether they be minerals or from other natural resources, will be allocated like this for the benefit of the household and for the benefit of the community. So women land rights is our problem and we have to, is the problem and we have to define it as, as it is. Every time that question uh, is raised, to me, I see it as more of the patriarchal backlash where uh, we want to suppress, you know, advocacy is about messaging. So if we, we, we define it and say it out there differently, we are not likely to achieve what we are targeting to achieve. Let's define it the way it is. Let's define our problem the way it is. What are the barriers? I think uh, the major barrier that uh, I've seen consist consistently is the attempt to block women from ascending to leadership. Because the moment they ascend to leadership, uh, in this institution, in parliament, in the executive, and I'm talking about people who actually believe in fully in women land rights. They could be women or men, by the way. Feminist people who believe in feminist values could be either. But the attempt to block such progressive minds into leadership is one of the major barriers that I see most of the status agenda. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, Frida. I don't know if other panelists would also like to add a little bit on the barriers when we're talking about power relations. Can I can I can, can I uh, just uh, see a bit on this? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, power. Uh, I mean, we we uh, so basically uh, when it comes to uh the issues of rights and uh and and women rights is basically challenging the fabric of the society we're challenging the fabric of the society and uh not just uh with the, we're challenging the status quo within the household we're challenging the status quo within uh, the community as well as challenging the government 
uh, in terms of sharing of power. So there is definitely, there is going to be resistance from all levels. There is going to be resistance at all levels. And we see, uh, we, and, and one big way against women we see is, is violence. Uh, yeah. Using violence against women, and there are a number of cases that are being reported. Uh, that that's and uh, where um, the main way to block them or scare them away is to is to uh, either have violence or you know put cases against them, even to the extent of sexual violence. So so uh, this this is a very common way of of dealing with women issues uh, or, or to or to block the women issues but but definitely uh, the 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 fact that there is a is a is there is a you know resistance says that there uh, there is a movement which is which is concerning people and and the fact that the movement is able to create a space for itself uh, i think is it's a it's a it's a significant step in terms of uh, challenging the status quo okay thank you uh, thank you uh, sritama i think we could um, continue to discuss this but i also have to move on to the other questions i would like to bring on two questions together because it's very much on the laws and um, one question is how can the these laws uh, are juridical instruments assist women to take up cases and the other question is very much related to that because uh, and I very much like it it's also the question if if there are experiences with female um, judges in one of the countries uh, or if there is any experience in in bringing female judges on board um, in terms of that they also can champion in such a way Great. Yes, uh, let me say I don't work I don't work in the corridors of justice, so I'm not a judge. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. I think it is it is it is good and it's important to have, of course, women in all areas of leadership, including to have them as judges. But it is women and men and youth again who believe fully in women's rights and who think women uh, demands are a priority that will bring change. So I've really, I wouldn't give a case study of where we had a case in front of uh, being attended to by a female judge and a male judge, because groups doesn't pursue uh, litigation as an intervention. So I will, I may not be able to comment fully on that. But yes, the laws are important in assisting the women to pursue cases. Absolutely, definitely, it's much easier even to do advocacy when the legal context is already set. But remember. Uh, we are not uh, championing for these rights in uh, an island. We also live in an ecosystem mm -hmm. where the judicial system itself has, has significant challenge. In fact, in the women to Kilimanjaro, in the demands by the rural women, one of the things that they raised is the high cost of seeking justice in court and also the bureaucracy around there and the corruption. So even if the law is set in a manner that it benefits the women, as long as we live in an ecosystem where these judicial institutions are not reformed, then it doesn't help in sorting out the issues of the women. So I think that is the downside, but the law for sure is a starting point and uh, it, is important. it helps with the, con with the advocacy context a great deal. One thing that I forgot to say is for the participant who asked about the land mapping model, they can also Google uh, Groots Kenya and they'll be able to see the step by step in our website or write to us. Okay, thank you for that, Frida. There is also still a question for Sridama on how India is contributing or pro progressing toward land rights for women. Uh, that's a. Uh, um... Uh, it's a very big question in terms of, uh, yes, uh, there have been a number of uh, steps uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, government has taken or over the period the movements have taken is um, one big uh, change that came in 2005 was amendment in the Hindu Succession Act, which governs the property rights. So for the first time in the ancestral property, uh, the right 
of um, of course the rights of the widow was recognized but now uh, uh, women daughters have equal share to men so that was uh, one big move uh, in 2005 but that only applies to the uh, uh, to the communities uh, who belong to the hindu religion uh, there has been a lot of movement in terms of women as farmers to be recognized as farmers, which is happening. We, we have policies and programs now which are targeting women farmers. Uh, again, um, as I mentioned, within the Forest Rights Act, first time the legislation recognizes uh, the titles uh, for individual, uh, the, uh, the um, titles of a cultivable lands in the, both the name of the men and, and woman. Uh, so, uh, other than that, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, Haji and others pointed out, there are a lot of social and uh, other things which are equally connected to, to the land rights. So, we, we do see actually that wherever land rights has a connection with violence, I mean, wherever land rights have been recognized are in a better state, whether India or outside India also, we see uh, um, countries uh, where the substantial women land rights have been recognized, there is a better economic uh, position and actually violences have come down. So, so uh, that's one thing for us as Indians to learn. India has um, a women's commission uh, which looks into the women's issues and land uh, is becoming one of the important uh, agendas within within uh, for them to to look at as uh, what is happening to the land rights of women. So so there are a number of policies and practices and a number of policies and programs. But the question is about its implementation and how politically how what is the political willingness to implement it? I think that's that's the greater question. Mm -hmm. Ah, very interesting. Thank you, Sridhama. I still have two questions to go. And Zira, you want to like to add something on the, the contribution of women judges. So maybe you can go first and then afterward I still would like to ask another question to El Haji. Yeah, just to, to, to bring the experience that we had last year that two women judges, uh, they received a process against the community a community complain about the conflict that we had with the investors. And the judge came on face of the, the group of women, the cooperative of women. And what happened is that she suffered the trend from the, um, the, the investor. I don't know if we, we don't know if it was from investor and so on. What happened is that uh, land is a, is a very important issue, is a very important asset for, for the investors and corporations that want to um, come in 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 our um, in our country that want to invest and in so when judges like women come and call on and and defend the right of the community or right of women, uh, most of the time they suffer a lot of repression uh, and it's it's not good. But I we believe is that is important to to target uh, women judges because they need also our support and bring them as a and this is what we we did. So we have a good partnership with with that as a movement. We have a good partnership with them. So we start to strengthen that. Um, just at that point. Okay. Thank you very much, and Zira. There's one last question because we, before we finalize this uh, webinar, and I would like to address it to El Haji, because there are two questions which are very much um, emphasizing, like what can be do done to change these cultural and social norms, these cultural difficulties, and the question is very much like what can be done also in primary schools and universities, or what what are they already doing to change these cultural norms? And, traditions. So maybe, Alhaji, you can give a very brief answer on that? Hello? Okay. I want to that uh, we have to integrate gender and women's rights in the curricular of formation, of training, mm -hmm. especially the training curricula of public, uh, public scholar and the center of uh, training like uh, when well we train the, the the agriculture uh, 
when we keep formulating the, 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 the agricultural yeah, science. I, I saw that if the community and all the actors in the community uh, understand the women's rights and also the women's understand their rights about uh, land and about all the other things, change will come. So if at the scholarly program, you integrate gender and streaming, and at the other, uh, the te at the television, for example, in Senegal, we see uh, there are many televisions. We must have program of sensitization of the public to women's rights. I think that it is uh, one way of uh, to change the program, and at the local level also, we have to 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 to, to create uh, a, 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 a cadre de concertation, um, uh, a framework of discussions about these questions because it is a lack at the local level. We, people don't discuss problems; they think that it is not a problem. Or it is uh, it isn't uh, it isn't a problem, or it is a real problem at the local level. Now, uh, after this, we have to continue to 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 to, to sensitize all the community. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, we, 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 uh, uh, working with the government to include uh, yes the environmental science on the scholarship at the primary school and okay, the gender wow. very and, uh, interesting el haji i think uh, we could uh, continue our discussion for hours i think uh, very interesting uh, contributions uh, but i'm afraid we have to end here uh, i would like to thank you all for this very interesting uh, opportunity to really exchange experiences and also to the panelists who brought it uh, uh, to the uh, to the audience because I think it were very interesting questions which we could of course discuss for much longer but I'm afraid we have to stop here so thank you Nzira El Haji Frida Sritama you were a great panelist it was uh, really great to have you on board and I would also especially like to thank Neil Sorensen from Land Portal because he have, has assisted us in this whole um, setup of the webinar and who has offered us the opportunity to connect across the globe to talk about these issues. I hope there were not too many technical issues but in general I think it's great that as in such a way we can connect and keep on putting the women's land rights agenda or the women's land rights issues at the center of the development agenda. Uh, so thank you all for being here and um, hope to meet live at another other opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. You did well. Thank you.